Hi, it's Janie from Reinvention Ready, and I am so excited to introduce you to Dr. Stephanie Munoz, our guest today. Stephanie is a yoga therapist and researcher from San Diego, working as a professor and research director at Southern California University of Health Sciences. She's always had a passion and a curiosity about the healing power of mindful movement. When Stephanie was doing research for eight years at John Hopkins, she was developing and evaluating a yoga program for people with rheumatoid and osteoarthritis. And this became the basis for her PhD in public health. And she is now the director and founder of Yoga for Arthritis, where she leads trainings for yoga teachers and yoga therapists while coaching and supporting people living with arthritis and chronic conditions. On top of that, Stephanie is an author and her first book, Yoga Therapy for Arthritis, was published in 2018. Her second book, a memoir, Driving Home, Cancer, Concussion, Mom and Me, will be published very soon. Stephanie, welcome to the show today. I am so excited to have you as a guest. I'm excited to be here. Thanks so much for having me. As I was researching about you, I heard on one of the podcasts, you were talking about the prevalence of arthritis and it's, it's prevalent in the adult population. About a quarter of the people are dealing with it. And then as we get older, it's even worse. So it's a big issue and a big reality for a lot of people, me included. And so no matter the diagnosis, um, you know, it can cause joint pain. It can cause discomfort, range of motion, and there's no cure. And right. yeah, that's, that's just, and, and, and so how do we live with this? People are looking for solutions. And one of the things that helped me, and I know that it's something that you're very passionate about is yoga. Hmm. And um, so that's actually how I found you was looking for some of your resources. So tell us a little bit more about the different types of yoga people can try that have positive influence on arthritis and, and how they can improve their life. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, so our estimate of prevalence for arthritis is a rough one. And that's because the most common form of arthritis is osteoarthritis. And in order to diagnose osteoarthritis, it requires having pictures of the joints, right? So uh, many people report having a little joint discomfort. They see their primary care doctor who says, oh, it's probably arthritis without doing the necessary tests to actually confirm that it's arthritis. So there is doctor diagnosed arthritis, and then there's what we call probable osteoarthritis, right? A bunch of people who have aches and pains in their joints, especially as they get older, that are likely to be arthritis. And that number is different from the inflammatory forms of arthritis, so autoimmune arthritis is where the immune system is degrading the joint tissue. There's a lot of similarity in symptoms, but the mechanisms are very different. Mm -hmm. And as you said, no matter what the diagnosis, there is joint pain and limitations on physical function and, um, and all kinds of impacts on quality of life that are shared across these diagnoses. The, the umbrella of arthritis as a term includes over a hundred different diseases and each of them has slightly different features. Uh, so it's important to recognize that they all have to be treated a little bit differently and even within the same diagnosis, two different people are going to have a very different experience of the same condition. Um, an example of that is that arthritis affects different joints for every person. So someone may have arthritis in the joints of their hands and someone else may have it in their knees or their hips and that's gonna impact their life very differently aside from the, the actual difference in disease diagnosis. Fortunately, and as you suggested, yoga can be useful for all of it. No matter which diagnosis it is, no matter which joint is affected, no matter how severe, how long. And I will point out, you talked about the adult prevalence, which increases as we get older, but there are also kids who are living with inflammatory forms of arthritis. In the US, it's about 300,000 children who have systemic inflammatory autoimmune arthritis of various forms. So it can really affect 
anyone across the lifespan. And yoga can be utilized in all of those cases. The key is, what do we mean by yoga? Mm -hmm. So there, there are, just as there are lots of kinds of arthritis, there are also lots of kinds of yoga. And when we're thinking about yoga in the West, oftentimes the first thing we think about is the physical practice, right. the postures, the movement, right? That's where a lot of the emphasis is. The term yoga means union or yoking or bringing together. And so one of the ways to think about it is the mind and body coming together. And yoga is a mind body practice like Tai Chi and Qigong also are, that we, we want the mind and the body to both be fully involved in the practice. It's not something where, well, we're doing this movement, but we're distracted and we're planning our grocery list. Similarly, it's not only a mental um, practice that doesn't involve the body, but union is not only referring to a unification of the mind and body, we can also think about it as the individual with the collective. So yoga is oftentimes practiced in groups and we're having kind of a shared experience and we're supporting each other. And this is one of the ways that it can help people with arthritis is being in community and feeling supported, especially as you're going through challenges that can make you feel isolated. And for some people, it's a spiritual practice, and it feels like a unification of the individual with the cosmos or with all of nature, for example. So there are lots of ways we can think about that union, but the practices that help us to achieve that union are not limited to just movement and poses. Yoga started out as a mental practice, and the position of the body was intended to help focus the mind. And over time, that evolved into all of these movements and poses that can be incredibly beneficial, but it's not required that you put your body in a certain position in order to experience unification of the mind and body. So when people are thinking about how can I use yoga to help with my arthritis management, I want them to think beyond the physical postures. The physical postures can be really helpful. And as many people think, well, you know, if you strengthen your leg muscles, then it's gonna stabilize your joints. Or if you stretch, then you're gonna improve your range of motion. All of that is true. But what makes yoga unique among physical practices that can help with arthritis is the mental aspect, is the mindfulness and the mindset and the regulation of the nervous system. And so all of that layered onto what we might be doing with movement impacts arthritis because it changes the way that we process pain. It changes the way that we live with a disease that has no cure, the challenges that we face in terms of what we can do with our bodies, all of that impacts who we are. It impacts our psychology, it impacts our family structures and our social life and how we see ourselves in the world. And so yoga as a whole toolkit can help us navigate life with these challenging conditions. Yes, that's so important that you brought that up. I I teach yoga as well. And oh, great. I so I teach obviously the asana, the postures, the movements, right. the vinyasa, the flow, but also yoga nidra, which yeah. all you have to do is lay there and listen to me when I teach yoga nidra. So I, and I like to say, you know, if you can breathe, you can, you can practice yoga. So there's so much involved in it. There's the mind, there's the breath. And, and do you have some examples that you can share of people who have worked with you and, and some of the results that they've experienced. It can be general, obviously, we don't want to name names. Um, but- yeah, sure. I actually, in my book, I have um, a few examples of stories that have been shared with me that I have permission um, to share. So I actually can be specific, um, but I, I will say that in general, the most profound changes that I've seen are the changes related to mindset. When people change the way that they relate to their disease, what does it mean to be in a body that doesn't always do what I want it to do or what I think it's gonna do? There are people who have said to me, not that they are grateful for the pain or the limitations, but they are grateful for the positive things that have changed in their life that may not have happened 
were, would it not be for the arthritis? So an example being when you're living with especially autoimmune forms of arthritis that have a lot of fatigue and flares and uncertainty around the progression of the disease, frequent changes in how the disease has to be managed, um, risk about infection and other conditions that may come with that. There is sometimes a reprioritizing of what is actually essential. How do I want to use the limited energy that I have? Because I can't do as much as I used to do, but I can still do plenty. I just need to be more selective in what that looks like. And when your energy resources are limited and you have to start evaluating what actually is important to me, it can it can bring more meaning to life than when you're in abundance of energy and can say yes to everything that comes across your plate. And so that process of evaluating where do I want to expend my energy is a yoga practice. Mm -hmm. Yoga is a mindfulness practice. It asks us to pay attention to what we're experiencing. And that's in the physical body, right? Pay attention to what's happening in my knees, but it's also pay attention to what's happening in my gut, pay my intuition, pay attention to what's happening in my heart with my feelings, pay attention to what's happening in my thoughts. And when you start to pay attention, you notice things that you may not have noticed before. And so using the yoga practices to be more aware of how we're feeling and the choices that we're making, I think is probably the most profound way that yoga helps with arthritis management. And, and I think life in general. I mean, I think when, right. when you practice yoga, you just become more at ease with what is. I think there's a there's a term called santosha, which is contentment. And we we find a way to build that contentment into whatever we're dealing with or just kind of trying to find that peace amidst whatever the storm is around. Right. Me. Which doesn't mean, you know, a lot of people think, oh, well, how could I possibly be content when I have this disease, when I'm in this much pain? And it doesn't mean that you're happy about it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I sometimes call it okayness, mm. you know, because that's maybe a little bit easier to reach for is can I be okay with this? Even if I'm not happy about it, can it be okay? Mm -hmm. And given that this is the reality, what can I do to optimize my experience rather than trying to, you know, magically change something unchangeable, like an uncurable disease? Right. And, and the, that that shift to what can I do yeah. rather than focusing on what I can't do is is big. And I think it's it's big in a lot of different mindset programs out there, not just yoga, but yoga. There's something about yoga. It's this this complete, you know, between your body, your mind, your it it just it works. And it's like I, I would say, where do people start? Because I think it's right. kind of one of those things that until you start, you it, it's an experience much more than it. You can't just read about it in a book. Yeah. 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 And a, a lot of people do come to it as a form of physical activity because they know that it's important to move when you have arthritis. And yoga seems like maybe it's a little bit more fun than getting on a treadmill. And, <laughs> and you know, maybe I might be more able to do it than something else like um you know, downhill skiing. Um, and so some people are drawn to it as a form of physical activity, and then they discover, oh, there's a whole lot more to this. For someone living with arthritis, it's really important to find the right fit. And so somebody like you who lives with arthritis would be really understanding of somebody coming in the door who may be um, had some joint limitations or was experiencing a little bit of pain or needed different versions of the physical practice in order to be safe and comfortable. Not every yoga teacher knows how to do that. And not every yoga teacher provides a class environment that is conducive to that kind of practice. I think it's unfortunate because I believe that every yoga class should be accessible to anyone. 
Uh, but the reality is that yoga teachers don't all have the same training. They don't all have the same amount of training, right? There is a wide um, variety of yoga teacher training programs. And the, the lower limit for how much you need to know to become a yoga teacher doesn't include any understanding of limitations or pain conditions or the therapeutic applications of yoga. Um, and so there are teachers who get advanced training in order to be able to do that. There are teachers who have an understanding of arthritis and chronic pain conditions outside of their role as a yoga teacher because they're also a nurse or because they're also an occupational therapist or because they also are living with arthritis and know how they need to change the practice for their own body. So you want to find a teacher who gets it. And that may be because they have advanced yoga training, it may be because they have other training, or it may be because they have lived experience that allows them to provide a safe and appropriate class. And so I would say do your homework. And that may include reading descriptions of the classes, reading the bios of the teachers, calling the location and saying, hey, I have arthritis and I'm looking for a yoga class. What would you recommend? And they might say, well, there's a gentle class or a beginner class or a therapeutic class. Or they might say, our studio, our location isn't really a fit for you. You might try the place down the street that has some appropriate options. So, so doing that work in advance to find a good fit is important partly to have a positive experience, but most importantly, in order to be safe, because while yoga can improve arthritis symptoms, it can also make them worse, <laughs> depending on whether or not you're practicing in a way that's appropriate for you. Right. That's, that's true. And, and I, every class, I always start it with everything I say to you today is an invitation. So yeah. if it doesn't feel right in your body, modify take a break, you know, do what you need to do on the mat for you. And I think people should always carry that into any yoga class they go into, because even if you have a, a teacher that's very experienced, they're still going to teach to the class. And if there's 20 people in the class, you know, they're, they're, it's difficult for them to, they may, like, I always try to level my classes up and we start with something easy and I say, hey, you can do this or, you know, right, do here right. Or, or go back to yeah. what we did last time or. And so I always give people these options. But, you know, a lot of times that's not the case in a class like you said. Yeah. And, and the trouble is, if you're a beginner yoga student, you may not know what to do differently. So you might right. look at what the teacher is offering and say, OK, well, that's not going to happen but I don't know what to do instead. And so starting off in a class that is slow, gentle, with a chair, in a chair, where you're really gonna learn the basics, mm -hmm. and even working with a yoga therapist or working one-on-one -on -one with a teacher who has that kind of background to say, okay, what is downward dog, as an example, gonna look like in my body? What right. is my version of that pose? So then I can go to any class anywhere and they're gonna do what they're gonna do and I'm gonna do what works for me. But you have to, if you're gonna do that, you have to be a student who is willing to take care of yourself and say, I'm gonna do something a little bit different in service of my own needs and my own body. And not every student feels comfortable doing that. Right, and they should feel comfortable doing that because that in, it's inevitable in a lot of classes that you're in, there's gonna be something, it happens to me, you know, I'll go to this class and they'll keep us on our hands for too long and my arthritis happens to me, my thumb joint, a little bit in my wrists and I can modify it. But sometimes I'm like, yeah, you know, I'm not gonna keep pushing this because it, it hurts me and I don't, I don't want to hurt. Yeah. And yoga they, they is not patient, it, not pain. Right. <laughs> right. It's not, not a no pain, no gain proposition. So no. that's the other thing is people think, oh, well, I should stay. I should push. I should move through it. And actually, if you are doing something painful, then from a yoga perspective, that's reinforcing pain pathways. And what mm -hmm. we want to do is find ease in the body. And so you wanna look for a different way to still engage, to still improve strength and mobility, but in a way that's not exacerbating your arthritis symptoms. Absolutely, yes, 100% agree on that one. So, um, so I wanna talk too a little bit about meditation. Yeah, great. 
because I think a lot of people have a lot of myths about what it is and how to do it. Yeah. And um, so I'll just let you take it. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Try so I actually, but I, uh, you're, you're my guest. So I'm yeah, like, yeah. And you can chime in too, because obviously you teach meditation as well as a yoga teacher. Um, so I actually just led an introduction to meditation course um, to my yoga for arthritis community, because I, I actually think that it is the most powerful practice in the yoga toolbox. It's where yoga started. Um, when we think about applying the philosophy of yoga to practice. And there's so much we're understanding about the way that scientifically meditation affects not just the brain, but also the body that is just it's mind blowing, um, figuratively. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so the misconception about meditation, well, there are many. Mm -hmm. One is that meditation means that you are sitting still with a blank mind in perfect peace <laughs> with your legs crossed uninterrupted for 20 minutes plus. Okay, that is a, an approach to meditation. I will tell you that even people who are dedicating their lives to this practice who are renunciate monks who meditate hours a day do not necessarily spend 20 min minutes with a perfectly blank mind and in absolute peace it's a practice mm -hmm. uh, and so one thing is that you're not doing it wrong if you're getting distracted the practice of meditation is noticing when you've gotten distracted and doing something about it. Mm -hmm. And so whatever the practice is, and there are many, so it could be focusing on your breath. It could be focusing on a word that you're repeating in your mind. It could be focusing on the flicker of a candle flame. It could be focusing on an activity like taking a walk or mindfully washing the dishes, whatever it is you're doing, what makes it meditation is that you're holding your focus. You are giving your mind a job of something to hold on to that we might call an anchor. And when your mind wanders away from that anchor, which it will inevitably do, your job as a meditator is to say, oh, look, I've gotten distracted. I'm going to bring my focus back to my breath or the dishes or this candle flame or whatever it may be. That is it. That's what meditation is. And that means that it can be adapted to whoever you are and whatever is going to work for you, which means if sitting cross-legged on the floor is not going to work for your body, which it's not going to work for most people with arthritis, it's okay to meditate sitting in a chair. It's okay to meditate taking a walk. Mm -hmm. It's okay to meditate lying down as long as you're not going to fall asleep. And there are ways that we might, because when you fall asleep, you're getting the benefits of sleep, but you're not getting the benefits of meditation. Um, and also whatever your belief system, your cultural orientation, your religious tradition, meditation can be aligned with that. So you can have a completely secular meditation where you are thinking about your breath in and your breath out. You can have a meditation where you focus on a prayer from your tradition that you repeat over and over again you can be focused on your connection to the natural world. So there are lots of ways to integrate meditation into whatever your worldview is. And in fact, meditation, while a part of yoga practice, exists in pretty much every world tradition around the globe in some form or another. The focus of the mind is a universal practice and there are lots of ways to do it. Very true. And there are lots of resources out there for folks yeah. too. Um, somebody can guide you through one. Right, which exactly, which is a great way to begin a meditation practice is to focus on the instructions of the person who's guiding you, right? So you don't have to make it harder for yourself than it is by thinking you have to be in absolute silence in the dark by yourself. You can be in a room where a teacher is guiding you through the practice. You can be listening to a recording on your headphones or speaker where someone is guiding you through the practice. And some of those guided meditations um, will 
talk you through the entire thing, what to do with your mind from the beginning to the end. And others will allow brief periods of silence or longer stretches of silence where you may notice that you get distracted and then you hear a voice bringing you back <laughs> to the focus of the meditation. So that can be a way to play with mm -hmm. the silent meditation practice as well. So Stephanie, what resources do you have that people can find on your website? What are some of the things that you offer people? So I have kind of two buckets of resources. One is for yoga teachers and yoga therapists who want to work more safely and appropriately with this population. So that includes continuing education programs and resources and examples. Um, and then there, the other bucket is for people who are living with arthritis who want to bring these practices into their lives. So that includes pre-recorded classes that you can watch. It includes courses to introduce you to these practices like that. Introduction to Meditation course is now available online and anybody can go through it. And we walk through a bunch of different approaches to meditation that you can try. Um, there. Are, there's also a membership and the membership has a bunch of things that are happening all of the time. So I run a book club and that's free to members. And so we take a deep dive into some philosophy and how we're integrating the practices into our lives. And I have a monthly Q&A for members where people can show up and ask any questions that they may have. And on our site, we have a teacher directory. So you can look for teachers who are trained to work with people who have arthritis, who may be in your area or who may have classes online that you can attend. And we also offer a 200 hour yoga teacher training that is for people living with arthritis and chronic pain who want to become yoga teachers because not only are, are yoga classes sometimes inappropriate for people with arthritis, yoga trainings are often inappropriate for people living with arthritis. So if you have arthritis and a traditional yoga training that asks you to do a lot of physical practice, sit long hours on the floor, be able to focus even when you have fatigue and you're interested in becoming a yoga teacher, that might be an option for you as well. And I also have a podcast. So um, for free, it's called The Yoga Room, R-H-E-U-M, like rheumatology. And in The Yoga Room, we have all kinds of guests who have arthritis themselves, who are experts in the intersection of arthritis and yoga, chronic pain management, the science of it, et cetera. So that's something people can check out as well. That's wonderful. You have a ton of, of resources. And tell me a little bit about this membership that, that you mentioned. Yeah, so um, there were a whole bunch of things that we wanted to be able to offer to people. And we wanted to create what, what you would know um, as a yogi, the concept of sangha or community, where it's not just, oh, here's a recording that you can do at home by yourself. But we know that one of the ways that yoga actually improve symptoms for people with arthritis is the sense of community, is that support. And we can see that because in the research, when you compare it to a group that does something else, the group that does something else also gets better to an extent because they have that kind of support and camaraderie. We learn from each other. So I, I want Yoga for Arthritis to be a community that I help to facilitate where we are all experts in our own way. I bring a certain kind of expertise, but everyone who's coming to our community, whether they're a yoga professional or a person living with arthritis, is an expert in their own area. And so creating the membership gives us an opportunity to all learn from each other. And that includes a, a private Facebook group where Teachers can ask questions of students like, hey, here's what I'm thinking of trying. Do you think that that would resonate? Or I'm a student and I'm looking for a way to do this particular practice or what do you think? So that community is really supportive. Um, and then every time we offer something, either it's free to members or there's a reduced rate for members so that it becomes more accessible to the people who are contributing their presence to our community. That is so important. I was watching the Netflix on the Blue Zones. 
Oh yeah. You see that? Yeah. Where um, they talk about how do you age? You know, these, these whole parts of the world where people live to be in their nineties, even sometimes a hundred and they're still active. You know, it's like, we all want to live long lives. I think if we can continue to live and, and be active in our bodies and all of them had community as, as a, one of the main things that, that helps you grow older with a little more grace and, and, a little more purpose. And I think we we've lost that a lot in, in the United yeah. States, just because people are kind of so focused on doing their own thing. And hopefully through what you're doing, I think that's, a, it's a great way for people who are struggling with arthritis to find other people and, and yeah. share and, you know, celebrate when things go well and, you know, have compassion when things don't go so well and just be there for each other. It's so important. The other thing was movement. So that brings in the types of yoga that, and then the spiritual aspect of it, which you said yoga is, it's not a religion. I think that's something that is a lot of it comes from the Hindu tradition, but really the practice of it is not even Patanjali's sutras don't mention any deities at all. And I think a lot of people automatically assume that, well, you have to be Hindu. You don't, you know, you can be believing in whatever you want to believe in. It, it's but, a philosophy, like ancient yeah. Greek philosophy yeah. is not a religion, right? You could like stoicism. Lots of people are interested oh, yes. in stoicism these yes. days, right? It's having a moment. That's not a religion. It's a philosophy. It's a way of thinking that can be applied to daily life for your betterment. Philosophy. And it, I love to call it a toolkit. Yeah, it's, right. it's a toolkit. It gives you tools that you can take and use when you go out into the world to hopefully make your life a little bit better and the lives of those around you better as well. So, yeah. Is there anything else you want to share with us? I know you've written a book. You got a couple. Is your other book out yet? Your when my, I my second book is coming out. With the publisher now. Okay. Yeah, we're doing yes. putting the final touches on the cover design and such. So stay tuned for that. Right. So my first book, um, Yoga Therapy for Arthritis, has a whole bunch of science in it because I am a research scientist, but I wanted it to be incredibly practical. So there are stories to provide inspiration and there are recommendations and there are practices throughout the whole book. So it's appropriate for yoga teachers who want to learn more. It's appropriate for people living with arthritis, for healthcare providers who want to know how to talk about yoga with their, their patients who are using it. Um, so that's available on the site and other books that I've contributed chapters to as well. And then my memoir, which is about a year in my life when um, my mother was dying, I was hit by a semi truck and had a traumatic brain injury and my family was living across two different states. And so that memoir actually does apply yoga practices and philosophy um, to examine my experience as well as a variety of other perspectives. So hopefully that will be coming out soon. And then my third book, which is at the very beginning stages, is about evidence-informed practicing yoga. So how can we take the science that we're learning in research and actually use it to make sure that yoga is as safe, beneficial, and appropriate as possible? That's awesome. So I want to, I do want to hear a little bit more about your, your life experience and, and this that sounds like a really rough time. <laughs> it, it was, it was, it was yeah. quite a year. <laughs> what were some of the things that helped you get through? You know, I, yeah. Yeah. So that um, it's funny because that actually was, I finished my book with a concussion, my first book. Um, and it, that was not easy. Um, I, I think that the, the events of that year, I have had a pretty blessed life. And the events of that year were absolutely the challenge of my life, um, partly because it was all happening at once. So I was navigating my own traumatic brain injury while I was caring for my dying mother, while I was driving back and forth across states in order to see my husband and son who were living three hours away. And by the way, driving was traumatic because I had been hit by a truck, but in order to see my family, I had to do it. So there was a lot. Um, and, and I think, you know, we were talking about the physical practice of yoga and the other practices of yoga. What I could do from a yoga perspective in the beginning of my recovery was very limited. Mm -hmm. 
And um, that's both the physical practice because I could not stand on one leg, which I've been doing since I was two years old as a dancer, but also the mental practices because I couldn't read two sentences without losing my place on the page. So meditation, you know, being able to focus my mind um, was not accessible either. So you would think, well, you know, if you can't do the physical practice, you can do the mental practice. But actually, I had challenges on both fronts. And part of concussion is emotionality. It's very, there are biological mechanisms for us feeling emotional, aside from the fact that it's emotional to be going through that while I'm navigating probably the most emotional experience of my life in losing my mother. So being able to find what I could do, which sometimes was just to breathe, sometimes was just to, you know, progressively relax my body, knowing that anything that I could do to reduce my stress was going to improve my recovery. And mindset, which a lot of that had to do with navigating my own identity and self-worth. Who am I as a research scientist if I can't read two sentences in a row? Um, you know, who am I as a person in a moving body who has run marathons when I can't, you know, stand on one foot. And so reevaluating the essence of my personhood was, I think, the main yoga practice and being able to, the, you were talking about Santosha contentment, not be okay with anything that was happening, but to find things that were okay. You know, losing my mother did not feel okay. But can sitting down to dinner with my dad be something that I can savor in the midst of all of this challenge? So, um, yeah, there's a lot of yoga philosophy in that exploration. And I wrote the book, you know, the first book I wrote was to take all of the information I had learned in years of practice and research and make it available to people. This memoir was for me to figure myself out. <laughs> And hopefully can be helpful to other people in the process, because for me, it happened to be um, grief and loss from these particular events. But everybody has that chapter in their lives. Everyone goes through a time in their lives that they feel like they don't have the inner resource to get through it. And so I hope that my journey through that and the way that I made sense of it for myself can be useful to other people in reflecting on their own experience. Wow. Wow. And that, and thank goodness for yoga, you know, when yeah. I've been through those dark night of the soul moments, I found that since I started practicing yoga, it's been easier than those times pre-yoga because I've only been really practicing it for about eight years and it is, it's different. You know, I went through a similar experience with a, a job transition that was much more stressful when I didn't have yoga than when I did. Right. Which, which doesn't mean that it's easy. <laughs> it's, no, it's, it's, just, it's not easy. Right. To be fine, but it's like, you just have, you, you have tools to deal with it. Yes. I, think, I think you said something really beautiful in that, which you were just talking about when you said I had to figure out me. Yeah. Yoga is so much about, I have to figure out me, you know, I mean, it's like, we want to be open to the world. And a lot of times I think we feel guilty about putting too much attention or on ourselves, but if you don't figure out you, you're not going to go out into the world in the best shape. Yeah. So. Yeah. I I think of self-care as service. Yes. If I am taking care of my own self, then I am a better human out in the world. And so, you know, people think, oh, well, it's it's selfish for me to sit and meditate for 20 minutes, or it's selfish to tell my kids that I'm going to go do my yoga. But actually, it's better for everyone else when I am doing those things, because I am even a nicer human in the post office when I have done my meditation than when I haven't. And so I like to think about the ripple effect of me showing up as a better human, being better for everyone around me instead of thinking, well, I'm only doing this for me so that I can feel better, so that I can be happy. No, I'm doing it so that I can be a better citizen in the world. 
Exactly. And and when you start doing these things, you do start to become a better citizen in the world, as well as take better care of yourself. So it's a really win-win, you know? Yeah. It, yeah. Um, so what would you tell somebody who, you know, let's say they've, they're, they're getting older. Um, this, this podcast is geared for people who are, are, are kind of facing these, these years, 50, 60 plus and start to have issues like arthritis or chronic health issues. And, and I mean, a lot of people think they're too old or, you know, change is too hard when they get, what would you say to those people that have gotten these diagnoses or struggling with that dark night of the soul? You know, what, what would you say? Yeah, it's, it's unfortunate that people have that perception, um, especially about yoga. I think it's partly because of the way that yoga gets represented visually in, I would say, traditional media and now social media, that you have to be young and thin and fit and flexible and um, look good whatever, and look right? Good. And you have to have a certain kind of <laughs> leggings and all of that ridiculous stuff that has nothing to do with the heart of yoga with a capital Y. And we have actually seen this in our research that even when a program is offered, by the National Institutes of Health or Johns Hopkins University um, that people who are likely to show up for the first class are younger, more flexible, and Caucasian race. Hmm. Because that's how we have represented yoga in the West of this is who does yoga. And if this isn't what you look like, then maybe yoga isn't for you. And that's incredibly unfortunate for a lot of reasons, some of which are that the people who might be able to benefit most from yoga are the people who are not comfortable coming. Mm -hmm. um, so let's break that down. Being less flexible. Well, if you're not very flexible, yoga can help you improve your range of motion. So there's nothing that says you have to put your body in a certain shape for it to be yoga, right? And I think that's a misunderstanding of yoga is that the shape looks this way. And so you have to achieve the shape for it to be yoga. Yoga is about what you are doing as you move toward that shape, what you're doing with your mind, what you're doing with your breath, what you're doing with your mindset and your perspective, what you're doing with your body in terms of your alignment and understanding your own experience. It has nothing to do with being able to touch your toes, for example. But it so it turns out that if you practice yoga, you're probably going to get closer to your toes. And so yoga can actually help with flexibility. And there is no minimum flexibility necessary to practice yoga. Age, you know, as we've been talking about, it's really important to stay physically active as we get older. And yoga, because it's so modifiable, can be adapted to whatever you're showing up with. Um, you do have to know what your health is and you have to know what to be careful about. So it is a good idea for anyone with health conditions and especially older folks to say to your doctor, hey, I wanna try yoga. Are there, is there any movement I shouldn't do? Is there any movement I need to be careful about? Are there any movements that actually would be really good for me? Because, for example, if you have osteoporosis, there may be some things that you want to be careful about. If you have a heart condition, there may be some things you want to be careful about. But if you're equipped with that knowledge, then yoga can actually improve heart disease. Yoga can improve osteoporosis if it's done in an appropriate way. And then being of minority race, it turns out that while arthritis it has a similar prevalence across racial groups, the symptoms tend to be worse in minoritized populations, partly because of structural racism and access to health care and not being taken seriously in healthcare spaces or welcomed into spaces where tools like yoga are available. And so if we as a yoga community can be sure to make our spaces inclusive um, and to welcome people of all backgrounds, including people from different religious traditions, people who have different um, ways of dressing or practicing their religion or, you know, different 
sizes and shapes of bodies, mm -hmm. um, yoga is for everyone. Because if you, have, as I think you said this, if you have a mind and a body, you can practice yoga, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so we have a long way to go to mm -hmm. make yoga as inclusive as the philosophy of it suggests. Yeah. And I would tell people that are older too, to just give it a try. And like you said, call the studio, find out what classes might be most appropriate and try it. And if, if, if one teacher or one class isn't your flavor, go try another Any, flavor. any even one studio, right? There are I, as many yoga I, studios as Starbucks now. And so, I, and, and it doesn't have to be a yoga studio. If yoga studios are intimidating to you, there are yoga classes at community centers and mm -hmm. at the Y. And so find a place that you feel welcome. And maybe that means trying it out online. Right. for starters. But I would suggest that if you're going to start online, you should do it live online with a teacher who's able to watch you and give you individualized recommendations before you try doing things that are pre-recorded where you're not going to be able to get any feedback from an instructor. Right. Or you can hurt yourself. I actually did that when I first started. Oh, wow. Really? Online. And I was totally doing these chaturangas wrong. And I, I will have tennis elbow now, probably for the rest of my life because <laughs> oh, of that. Um, <laughs> But, you know, again, I have the tools to deal with it. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> yeah, I would Lesson learned. If you can have somebody watch you and teach at least, you know, maybe the beginning. There's a lot of studios out there that will do like a four or six week session of learn yoga and, and they'll go through. And, and do you offer that on your site as well? Some live yoga teacher um, or some maybe some of the teachers that that you have? Yeah, there's definitely a um, there's a calendar with teachers classes that are on there. And um, we are working on offering the 16 class series that we use in our research. Mm -hmm. And so we know that that's associated with a 30 percent reduction in pain um, so that we hope that that is helpful to people but also I work with people one-on-one -on -one. so that could be a really great way to start is just do a single session with me mm -hmm. and let's figure out what your unique needs and limitations are so that when you do show up for that first beginner class you know okay well instead of putting my hand like this I'm going to do it like that and that's going to feel better for me. So I, I do that on Zoom. And so I'm happy to do that with people wherever they're located. That's that's great to know. Great to know. Yeah. So Stephanie, this has been such a great conversation. And I, I can't wait to go back on your website and like dig a little bit deeper into some things and maybe join one of your groups. It sounds great. Um, anything else you want to share with the audience before we head out today? Um, I, I think that the as we were talking about yoga practice, you know, it's an inside job. <laughs> and so um, having grace with ourselves as we're starting anything new, whether it's yoga or, or anything else to, um, to be as loving toward ourselves as we are to other people. I think when you start paying attention to your own thoughts, oftentimes we notice how negative we are toward ourselves. And so if you think about the talk toward yourself as being as kind as the way that you would talk to somebody else, I think that goes a long way in actually changing the biochemistry of our bodies and the way that we experience pain is just having a little more grace and loving kindness inward that I think then makes us more capable of having more loving kindness outward, which we know from what's going on in the world, we need more of that all around. Thank you so much. Your your wisdom has just been so wonderful to hear today. So I am grateful to you for being on the show. And uh, real quick, do you want to just give your website and how people can reach you? And we'll put it up on the screen and in the notes as well. Wonderful. Thank you so much for having me. The, the website where you're going to find absolutely everything is just arthritis.yoga. Easy to remember. Very easy. Yeah. <laughs> and dot yoga. That's dot pretty cool. yoga. Yeah. Well, Stephanie, thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate thank you. you. Thanks for having me. And thank you for doing this for people. It's really wonderful. Wasn't Stephanie amazing? She is truly a treasure and a wealth of information. 
So if you're listening and watching all the way to the end of this podcast, I'm hoping that you got a lot out of it. And if you did, would you be so kind as to like, subscribe, comment, give us a five-star rating. Anything you can do helps us get this information out to more people. And I think so many people need what we're sharing here, especially as we grow older. So again, this is Janie Genosis with Reinvention Ready. Thank you for listening and watching. Go out and make the rest of your life your best life. See you soon.